Shander. Uh, he's an emeritus, emeritus chair, Department of Anesthesiology, uh, Critical Care Medicine, Pain Management, and Hyperbaric Medicine at Inglewood Hospital and Medical Center in Inglewood, New Jersey. He's also adjunct a clinical professor, Department of Anesthesiology, Medicine, and Surgery at ICON. Uh, School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, as well as clinical professor of anesthesiology at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School in New Jersey. Dr. Shander served as the executive medical director of the Institute for Patients Blood Management and Bloodless Medicine and Surgery at Inglewood Hospital, and as president of the Society for the Advance of Patients Blood Management. He serves as a director for education for team health. Dr. Shander lectures nationally and internationally on a variety of topic uh, related to anesthesiology, critical care medicine, and patients' blood management. And his more than 200 peer reviewed publications have appeared in several prestigious peer reviewed medical journals. His publications are in the top 5% of the most read authors for academia. In 1997, Dr. Shander was recognized by Time Magazine as one of the America's heroes of medicine. In 2015, he was the recipient of Inglewood Hospital and Medical Center Foundation's highest honor, the Touchstone Award in recognition of his commitment in uh, EHMC. In 2019, Dr. Shander received the Award of Excellence of the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society for his excellent contributions to the science and practice of blood medicine and surgery. And he has an annual lecture named after him by the Society, the PMMS, the PMSS Ari Shander Lecture. With this, I'll uh, give it to you, Dr. Shander. And sorry, I mean, uh, you have a long bio, which took some of your time for the presentation. So you have until 8.50, Dr. Jen. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Majed. And uh, I'm, as you were, as you were uh, presenting uh, the introduction, I was wondering how long we've known each other, and it's been quite a while. So again, thank you. Uh, also, I want to thank uh, Jamela for putting uh, the context together, which uh, in terms of compassion, uh, and, uh, of course, uh, Nathaniel uh, is, uh, took the thunder of my uh, talk, so uh, again, some of it will be repetition. But before I start, it's clearly not just a pleasure for me to see everyone, but it's, um, it's always an honor to uh, participate in this particular uh, meeting and uh, to, again, uh, be uh, a part of this group. Um, I'm not sure who... Uh, who actually came up with the topic compassion at the heart of bloodless medicine and surgery but that was the topic that i was given as you see from the title of my first slide and i hope you could see the slide i think that um we are immersed in that, could you change could you change your view to make it uh yeah up there Exactly. Okay. So, so things changed over uh, since we uh, last uh, spoke. Anyway, um, uh, I think that we as uh, healthcare providers uh, sort of live sometimes in a cocoon of healthcare. And those of us work in uh, both patient blood management as well as bloodless medicine and surgery also have uh, sort of a, uh, uh, a very local view of what it is that we do. But we need to put compassion, I think, in uh, a global um, environment rather than just looking at a local environment. And uh, the world, of course, is no stranger to uh, both uh, violence as well as atrocities. And I think that uh, we would be remiss uh, not, again, mentioning the fact that we could all, meaning the whole world, can use a dose of compassion. Uh, as we get uh, and perfect violence, uh, as we've seen over the last few weeks, uh, and of course, uh, times before that, um, it really puts into uh, perspective a lot of what we do in terms of caring for people. And I think that uh, it's important for us to always remember 
that uh, violence begets violence and never solves a problem. Uh, there's an old Chinese proverb that says that if you're uh, out for revenge, make sure you take two coffins, not one. Uh, so again, uh, we don't see any any positive effect, and no one's right when it comes to uh, violence, regardless of how you want to rationalize uh, who's right and who's wrong. So I think putting all that in context, we need to know that everybody has a right. All people in this world who are born into this world have the right of existence. And it, uh, it's us who need to ring the bell again of compassion and understanding rather than continuing uh, this cycle, which uh, ends up uh, not just harming uh, the world, but clearly uh, individuals who have uh, nothing to do with the violence. So, um, I'm sorry, but I think that we do have to make mention of these events uh, before we start. So as we move on, uh, my talk today is uh, to look at the definition of compassion and empathy, which you've heard already from Nathaniel before, but looking at it from the implications of healthcare professionals, which we all are, um, again, talking about compassion, empathy, and bloodless care, how those three elements fit together. And uh, there was a question in the literature that is it ne really needed, is compassion and empathy needed uh, in healthcare? Meaning, can we pr still provide good healthcare, or uh, as mentioned before, uh, the best type of healthcare without compassion? And I think that that's a question that needs to be addressed. Then I'm gonna move on to can compassion and empathy be learned? Because if it can, I think we have a duty then to include that in what we do when we talk to people about uh, bloodless care, when we talk about uh, any patient blood management or any part of healthcare, uh, that there are ways that we can actually teach people to be compassionate and empathetic. And then as we look at the uh, learning part of that, we need to know what the elements uh, that actually work to adopt compassion into daily practice, meaning what is it that we need to address with individuals as we're teaching them in the most effective way for them to become more compassionate, understanding and empathetic uh, when they are actually caring for each one of us as human beings. And of course, we'll finish with the message, which is compassion is at the heart of bloodless medicine and surgery. Well, you've heard uh, already uh, before from Nathaniel, what is compassion? So when we go back to the different types of uh, dictionaries out there, uh, there are a couple of uh, definitions, but according to the Oxford English Language Dictionary, um, those who work in etymology, which is the origin of language and words, uh, ascribe or describe uh, compassion as a 14th century term from Latin, which is common patty, which equals to bear and suffer. So the meaning uh, has evolved over the years, I think, but uh, as you could see that trying to put together the history of compassion. I dare to say, though, that I think compassion has probably been around uh, for those of us who are believers since creation and those who are skeptics uh, since the beginning of time. Because even when we had to, say, uh, overcome an animal so that we can have uh, um, uh, protein, uh, meat protein, uh, there was always some kind of compassion with that um, in the form of thanks, whether it was a thanks to the Almighty or thanks to the fact that this was available through biology, whatever the thank you was, it had that element of compassion. So that at the 14th century may have sort of narrowed it down to specific activity, which we'll get to in a minute. This includes, of course, as you see, uh, the word sympathetic, uh, the word pity and concern for the suffering or the misfortune of others. So compassion, again, uh, in, when it comes to human elements or the human, um, uh, human beings, uh, clearly has much more of a halo around it than just understanding uh, the suffering of individuals, but also the reaction that we have to that, whether it be a positive or a negative. Uh, this was an example from the Oxford English Language Dictionary. They say, putting it into a sentence, the victims should be treated with compassion. Um, I think that uh, it's not just the victims. I think that there's probably room for compassion for everyone um, around, and we just have to find that thread 
uh, where compassion can be applied even in times when the person who we're dealing with may not be a victim. So what entered into the compassion world, if you will, in terms of etymology or the, the uh, as I said, the, the ev evolution of language is the word empathy, which is coined, I think, or has been included as part of compassion or even the other side, meaning the other side of the mirror or the other side of the coin uh, in the 20th century. Uh, and uh, again, going back to the dictionary, uh, when you're looking at compassion and empathy, uh, a caring response to someone else's distress, empathy refers to an act of sharing an emotional experience of the other person. Compassion adds to that emotional experience a desire to alleviate the person's distress. So it's sort of a combination, if you will, in my mind, of do no harm, or actually do good. So you need to not just do no harm. Uh, that is insufficient, and you've heard me say that before. You need to have the action part, which is do good. So we're both expected as healthcare professionals to have the understanding of the empathy, which is the sharing of the emotional experience, but then we need to have the active part of it, which is to alleviate that person's distress. Now that could be physical or it could be mental or together, maybe both of them. So again, examples is empathy. I feel your pain and compassion. I value your concern and willing to make things better. I think that sort of puts it into perspective. So what are the implications for healthcare providers like us? Well, compassion, I'm sorry. Compassion is a core value of healthcare that includes, of course, empathy, as we talked about before, understanding. Um, understanding is clearly a global term, if you will, um, which can extend from any small particular understanding of what you're saying to understanding where you actually stand in the world, as mentioned earlier today. Um, giving it some perspective so that you can now at least address this individual's concerns, whether it be personal concerns or whether it be social concerns. Care for well-being of people. Again, I think that that's an important element of a, compassion as a core value. And again, it becomes a, a form of substitution. Uh, here's the, the uh, t if, if you will, the example of what we call an ethics substitution is to put oneself in the shoes of another. Trying to understand uh, what it is that another person is going through, whether it be physically or emotionally, trying to put ourselves in their shoes, if you will, or in their position. Not an easy thing to do, but something that we're called on to do in many, many ways, and that's something can actually be learned. Understanding patients' fear, pain, and concerns clearly is part of uh, the compassion as we break it down. And providing emotional support in conjunction with medical care um, is utmost important because it is not just uh, delivering the actual mechanical medical care. It's really seeing the person through that care by understanding what are some of their concerns and their goals actually in terms of uh, therapy. So compassionate healthcare professionals treat both physical ailment and emotional and psychosocial needs of every patient. Now, as you all know that that's probably not a true statement because that not, doesn't always happen. However, um, there may be a, we may be able to separate this out to different people because the care of a patient is not by one individual, it's by a team. So different team members can actually own these parts of this particular um, statement that you see in yellow at the bottom of the slide. So what are, again, the implications for healthcare as mentioned, compassion is an essential component of patient-centered care. And what we do when we do bloodless care and what we do when we do patient blood management is patient-centered care. Hence, we cannot move without having compassion in the center of what we're doing. It actually allows for positive impact on all overall healing of a process of any kind of individual, whether it be, again, physical or psychological. And it leads to improving patient satisfaction, something which we now have learned to value. 
as a part of delivery of care in terms of looking back to see how the patient actually went through the journey of healthcare and whether they were satisfied with everything that they or uh, that they actually received in terms of their expectations coming into healthcare and of course the expectations that they have with them leaving uh, the journey through um, throughout healthcare. Now we move on to bloodless care and trying to put this in the context of compassion. So again, most of us identify bloodless care as a care of Jehovah's Witness patients, but in fact, as we know, that bloodless care uh, is defined in terms of patients for whom blood is not an option as a therapeutic intervention. So there are other individuals, those who are concerned with the risk of allogeneic blood. Again, the numbers are small, and there are other religions that may actually um, evolve into individuals deciding to decline the treatment uh, with blood. The underlying medical issue, of course, is that no transfusion of any major blood components, making it an issue for healthcare providers who are under the impression, again, that all blood, again, may actually confer benefit uh, at very little risk. So ultimately for patients, uh, as I said, it's a, a making an issue for healthcare providers and ultimately for patients if and when compassion and empathy are ignored. So if we don't understand the concerns the patients have, for, especially those patients whom blood is on, not an option, um, and we, again, do not approach them with compassion and empathy. Uh, this creates a conflict, a conflict which, again, can ruin the experience of a patient, but actually can harm them both physically as well as emotionally as they go through the journey of their care. Not placing your feet in another person's shoes leads to confrontation and poor care resulting in poor outcome. As a matter of fact, we know that when that happens, uh, outcome of patients may actually be their demise. And we've seen that time and time again. So we can't really put compassion in the backseat as something which is soft data, if you will. Uh, we need to bring it to the front row because as you know, if the care lacks compassion or empathy and the desire and the goals of the patients are ignored as a result of that, it can actually lead uh, to their demise. Compassion plays a crucial ro role in the context of bloodless care. It's having a unique needs and concerns. Bloodless patients have a requirement that healthcare providers need to meet <clears throat> the requirement that they need to meet, including understanding where the patient's goals are. Their autonomy must be respected. And again, understanding that each one of us has the ability to, again, exercise our autonomy over our body. Uh, respect of beliefs it doesn't mean that you have to agree with them. Uh, but what you need to do is that everyone has a right to existence and everyone has the right to believe. And in fact, understanding the belief may open your mind to a new horizons. It's not just rejecting it right off because you don't believe in something that another individual does. A willingness to explore other modalities for care befitting the requirements. Again, if you're allergic to a medication, we need to search for something else. If a particular intervention in medicine does not fit that patient's goals, we need to search for others. We may not be able to find them, but we can come back to the patient with compassion and understanding and be able to communicate with them our efforts, as well as the fact that there was respect for their autonomy and beliefs. Again, assuring their safety and well-being in what could be a hostile environment, which can occur very, very quickly if uh, the two are, uh, are expressing different beliefs and different goals for their care. Uh, and again, where compassion and sympathy um, and empathy are not, uh, are not uh, being exercised. A compassionate approach to the bloodless patient involves open communication. And that is probably the first rule. The open communication means that the clinician can actually discuss their position in a, in a 
pretty open way uh, to have the patient also understand uh, if there is a conflict, but also to understand and draw from the patients what they believe and what their expectations are. An all-out effort to understand the patient's preferences and values. By doing such, meaning the all-out effort, effort, what will happen is we can align our preferences and values with the patient and come up to an understanding in terms of what course we're going to take with that patient care. A commitment to find the best possible medical solution that aligned with the patient's preferences and values. You heard the same uh, from the previous introductions. Uh, this is an important element when we talk about bloodless and compassion. So aligning both patients and healthcare professional preferences is not just important, it is crucial for good outcome in the care of the bloodless patient, and in fact, in the care of any patient. So moving on to further on compassion and bloodless, compassion is a core value in healthcare that applies universally. So um, you mentioned that already before, but I think it's well worth repeating that the fact that compassion is needs to be applied universally, not just in bloodless or any other form that we're dealing with. But bloodless care is specialized approach that ca caters to patients' special needs. Under so those uh, uh, circumstances, we're now coning it and narrowing down to the bloodless patient. Compassionate healthcare providers can and must adopt their approach in order or ad adapt their approach in order to provide the best possible care. So there needs, there is a need for adjustment. The fact is that we sometimes come into a situation where we're completely rigid, opening ourselves to communication with a patient and understanding where they come from will help us adapt again to something which we, we may have not been thinking about before, but needs to be addressed if we're going to deliver and meet the patient's expectations. They have to be, of course, reasonable. In some situations, some healthcare providers may not value patients' preferences and may see them as, neg as negating good clinical practice. So again, this is uh, providing uh, the, the ability to adapt under the circumstances, which is not very easy to do for many healthcare providers who may be armed with misinformation. These circumstances call for patients' advocacy and for healthcare providers to advocate for bloodless patients by ensuring their safety, while their preferences for special care are accommodated while providing the best medical care, which also includes the ability to recognize that I, as a healthcare profession, professional, cannot provide uh, the care that you're looking for, and also be open enough to say, I am not able to adapt, but I will find somebody who can. It is essential for us to do that. And unfortunately, my experience uh, over the years has been that many have neglected the patient in terms of this advocacy issue and let them linger uh, in, in many ways suffering uh, without the appropriate help. So is compassion universal in healthcare? Empathy and compassion are vital components of healthcare quality. However, physicians frequently miss opportunities for empathy and compassion in patients' care, not because they don't care. It's just that they miss the opportunity where they can actually interject compassion and empathy in such a way that will help the patient, but also help the, the clinician. Despite evidence that empathy and compassion training can be effective, the specific behaviors that should be taught remain unclear. So this goes back to what we mentioned early on in the introduction is the impact of the learning of compassion and empathy. So here's a publication that came out of the American Journal of Medicine, the so-called Green Journal. Empathy in medicine, what is it? How much we really need it? And uh, just to quote from this particular uh, manuscript, it says that empathy plays a critical role in the physician-patient relationship and has a positive impact on health outcome. Again, I think that this is something that repeats itself over and over again. However, as the field of empathy expands, the luck the lack of conceptual coherence challenges advances in medicine. In fact, in some medical setting, there is little added theoretical or clinical value in applying all encompassing, encompassing term of empathy. 
which is by nature multidimensional, interpersonal, and modulated by context. So again, you need to read the room is essentially what we're saying. Functional neuroimaging studies of health of professionals designed to examine patterns of brain activation in response to empathy eliciting a situation bring theoretical clarity to the neurocognitive mechanisms that underlie interpersonal sensitivity, emotional empathy, cognitive empathy, and caring. These components are relatively independent but often interact and are deeply interwoven in the fabric of brain. So again, this is a thinking process, not just a heart process in it. So when we look at the anatomy of empathy and compassion, empathy should be broken down into its component. Uh, again, by breaking it down, we can actually address those different components. These components refer to distinct psychological process that vary in the function of neuro, neurobiological mechanism. There's a critical analysis of functional neuroimaging studies with health professional that calls for a nu nuanced assessment of empathy function in medicine. We can actually identify the anatomy, if you will, or function on, functional anatomy of the brain. The positive effect of patients uh, uh, physicians perceived empathy can be explained by the synergy between social baseline theory and predictive process of neural inference. So again, it's emotional empathy necessary in medicine was another publication that came up looking at some authors argue that minimal amount of emotional empathy is needed to help physicians understand the subjective states of their patient. So we need, again, a threshold of some emotional empathy. On the other hand, too much emotional empathy can lead to burnout and compa compassion fatigue, which are not usually associated with empath empathetic concern. So again, overdoing it may actually reduce empathy or may actually turn on the individual healthcare provider with burnout. Practitioners who are most vul uh, vulnerable to burnout, which leads to detachment and low sense of accomplishment, again, the antithesis of compassion, may find it difficult to regulate their negative emotions and maintain a clear distinction between self and others. This is where we need to be compassionate with our colleagues. It's not just the patients. So again, the call for compassion is going to help in this particular devastating situation of burnout. Nevertheless, an important question remains as to whether the capacity to be affected by an obser um, observable or inferred affective experience of others, that is emotional empathy, is necessary. Uh, this is, again, from the same article, and I'm not going to belabor because of time, but you could see that there are multiple areas in the brain that are elicited both by the person who is being compassionate and those who are receiving the compassion, so that the brain is responsive. So this is not just a soft, if you will, uh, heart type uh, approach, but there is some hard uh, evidence uh, for the lack of a, dev, uh, a different term uh, to show that this is actually has some function uh, with related ana ana anatomical locations uh, that are described over here in this particular slide. So there's got to be a sober perspective on empathy that goes without saying the patients expected uh, or expect their doctor to be human, attentive, warm, caring, communicative, and understanding. These qualities of empathetic concern, sympathy, and compassion in contemporary medicine are of paramount importance uh, for clinical practice. Again, the same message over and over again. Specific biological mechanisms explain their positive effect on patients. These qualities, rather than the incongruous ideas of emotional sharing and imaging, uh, what the patient feels, or imagining, I'm sorry, what the patient feels uh, should be cultivated in medical education. So again, we know that these things can be learned and it's important for us to identify how to teach them. So in addition, it's important that physicians are comfortable with themselves and feel safe so that they can be more open to others and express caring attitude, again, without overdoing it. 
This is a, a publication uh, from 2018 from PLOS One, uh, cur a Curricula for Empathy and Compassion Training in Medical Education. This was a systematic review, and they looked at multiple different behaviors uh, from this particular group that looked at this. This is uh, came out of uh, New Jersey. Uh, it looked at behavioral behavior that was identified in 52 studies. And they're listed here, not necessarily in hierarchy, but to understand that sitting during an interview shows that you're connected with the patient and is not only empathetic, compassionate, but also creates an understanding. Detecting non-verbal cues of emotion. Facial expressions are almost important to be able to read on both sides. People read them from both sides. And again, they should be followed with explanations, not just leaving somebody to wonder whether they have an emotional, uh, um, uh, that is that the emotion that's created by facial expression is the, is the end of it. Recognize an opportunity for compassion. When is it that you can stop for a minute and address the patient's concerns? Nonverbal communication will already address with nonverbal cues and the validation support statement. Again, trying to make sure the patient understands that we understand what it is that they're going through or what their expectations are. And these were some of the number of studies that they looked at. And in black is what was successful and the gray was not so successful. And you could see the standard standardized patients is very important as well as role play. The small groups in terms of looking at response from patients may not be as successful as we'd like. And of course, didactic is important to set the stage as we're doing today, but role playing uh, as well as uh, standardizing uh, approach to patients is extremely important. So they summarize that the current evidence suggested training can be enhanced, um, can enhance physician uh, empathy and compassion. Again, uh, this report has coll collated the medical education literature, skills and behavior to enhance uh, physicians' empathy and compassion improve a framework for which research and educators can uh, develop evidence-based curricula. Uh, as I'm moving towards the end, what works for uh, whom and compassionate training program? Again, the same question, looking at a large number of um, uh, this is called the realistic review. You could see large number of manuscripts for review and the 43 were analyzed. You could see the different elements that go into teaching, if you will, compassion and empathy. And of course, the results in doing it. It's too busy for us to go through this in detail, but these slides will be available. And at the end of the day, they concluded that, again, you need to be able to break it down into different elements as shown in the previous slide. And again, that can be taught and can create a sustained culture of compassion in healthcare if the whole institution, meaning everyone together, works to create a culture of compassion and empathy. So uh, to end compassion and at the heart of bloodless medicine and surgery. Again, this is universal core value in healthcare. Special needs such as bloodless care need adoption across the board of both compassion and empathy. Uh, too little or too, sorry for the, for the misspelling, but too little or too much uh, compassion can result in negative outcome as already shown, but there's also room for compassion for those who have suffered from too much. Training and education must be ongoing and integral part of all healthcare professional. And lastly, compassion must be a value that is in interjected at all levels of care and the uh, uh, of care as well as the institution that's providing that particular care. And with that, I would thank you.